Hello everybody, Simon Dixon here. Last week was a bigger disaster in terms of escalation. On the humanitarian side, we've hit 10,000 deaths in Gaza. Uh, if you believe the Israeli numbers over the Palestine numbers or the Gaza numbers, um, then the Israeli numbers have come in as doubling the estimate to 20,000. So um, Biden and Blinken were making a hoo-ha early on that they don't believe the numbers that are coming out from Gaza. Well, it turns out that Israel believes that those are being underestimated. And the true tragedy is that close to half of those are children. Um, and remember, 70% of the population um, were refugees from what I covered in previous videos where we had the Balfour um, negotiation and declaration and all that type of stuff. Um, make sure you check out the Who Owns Israel uh, video in order to understand a bit more about that history. Um, well, putting aside the humanitarian side, the reason that I first started giving these videos and doing these videos is because um, historically, even before I got into Bitcoin, I used to follow the money in order to try and forecast what was next. This is what allowed me to leave investment banking in 2006 uh, before the financial crisis because I was following the money in the flows into the fractional reserve banking system and I started uh, giving lectures across the world on monetary reform. Now, nobody cared at the time until we had the 2008 financial crisis and then everyone cared and a documentary I was featured in, 97% own, got like 3 million views rather than a few people in a room and universities chucking me out of the room because they weren't happy with it, uh, the content that I was covering. Um, and so obviously that then led me to Bitcoin later as an exit from the financial system and uh, you know forecasting some of the things uh, that I have. I released a video called The Great Depression of the 2020s from a lecture I gave in 2009. That's all on my YouTube channel, spoke at the first Bitcoin conference. Um, now, the reason that I say that is because uh, people are asking me to stop giving content on this topic. And I have been giving content on this topic because I want to firstly educate myself. And so by giving content to you, I have to educate myself. And also people are saying that I'm very biased. Now, clearly you will know my beliefs around what is the oppressor oppressive um oppressed relationship here um however if you turn on mainstream news or you turn on any normal um you know uh, tv that is uh, controlled by a western narrative you get that story so i don't need to give that side of the story because that side of the story is being inflicted upon everybody this is the alternative side that's not getting um, the attention that it deserves, but because it was given attention um, through hundreds of thousands and millions of people protesting around the world, uh, leaders have had to change their narrative rather than saying it is a one-way thing to recognizing some of the history. So what we are doing has impact, and I believe everybody that has some kind of influence uh, needs to use their influence to help people at least have the information of the alternative. And so this one is going to be very focused on the alternative. And um, I, just before we go into the topic today, which is about um, is this genocide, is this ethnic cleansing, or is this leverage towards negotiating a two-state solution? In future videos, I'm going to share um, my thoughts on um, why this may be, you know, uh, all of those topics. But I needed to go through some of the experts. And so I put together a compilation of videos that helped me in um, understanding the alternative um, non-conventional uh, understanding of this that the that, that those in Gaza and that those uh, Palestinians have been trying to get out to the world uh, for so many years. Um, but we're starting to get a very clear understanding. So in future videos, I've got the understanding that I think I need to be able to follow the money and try and help us understand what comes next. We now know that uh, the Israeli government is estimating that this is going to cost them 12 months of war will cost them 50 million, uh, 50 billion rather, 
uh, not 50 million, uh, 50 billion um, in terms of direct cost. That's not, uh, you know, that's just for funding the war. Uh, that doesn't factor in all of the economic disasters that will follow. Um, but it's being very clear that even though Israel has been following some of the, um, you know, the, the same actions that led to Russian sanctions, um, it's very clear that sanctions are only a thing um, if you uh, are on the opposite side to the ideology of the US and Europe. And so you can commit the same war crimes, um, but if you are on the side of Europe and uh, America, uh, then you don't get sanctioned for committing the exact same act. Ordinarily, if this were a different type, a different country um, that didn't have the strategic relationships that Israel and US have, uh, then this would have been sanctioned uh, right now, and uh, that would have had its impact. And even in the Russian side, they sanctioned the central bank, which uh, I covered in real time while it was happening on this YouTube channel um, that I believe is the fall of the dollar and the final phase um, that led to lots of de-dollarization. Okay, so on the financial side, I'm going to get a bit more, a lot more deeper into it. Um, by following the money, we now know the impact and what uh, uh, Israel is going to need. Um, we also know that um, the, two, the, the, the reported solution uh, for the last six months that the US was uh, pushing for um, was to ethnically cleanse Gaza into, um, into uh, Egypt uh, and then negotiate a two-state solution. And either they return or they don't. Now, obviously, in Gaza, they had bad experience uh, from the refugees that were not able to return despite the promises last time. Um, and so this is obviously a deep fear. I spent a lot of time um, listening to debates between both sides and people that were giving commentary on both sides um, throughout the weekend. Um, and uh, even though it was my birthday, uh, and thank you for all the happy birthday messages. Um, but this is uh, far too important as well uh, for me. And so we also know that Egypt is heavily in debt to the International Monetary Fund, and that's where I began my career, tracing the flows of funds uh, between countries and IMF, tied loans, how it goes back into the military industrial complex, and how that fuels the fractional reserve banking system, with the US dollar being the largest, the world's largest regulated Ponzi scheme. Um, and uh, and then tracing different cycles. So we're going to be able to get closer and closer to the financial content next, uh, now that we've laid some of the, the foundational knowledge. Um, other things I want to do is go beyond, um, you know, the history that, uh, you know, to understand a bit more about, uh, you know, the Jewish um, oppression, uh, when that was the case there. Um, and, uh, you know, the theological history behind that to help us all understand the psychology. And then that lays the foundation for me to be able to talk about all the different monetary flows uh, so you can see how I think. And the goal being is that this last week, there was massive escalation. This is highly likely to escalate towards a regional war. And then if this starts to seep, you've got to only look at what the US was seeking funding for in their current bills in Congress. Uh, because it is a democracy, we get to see those things. Um, and they were, you know, obviously the four things they care about is um, you know, is increasing the border, uh, the wall on their side, um, funding for Ukraine in the Russia-Ukraine war, funding for Israel in whether we call that a genocide, um, an ethnic cleansing, um, or a war that leads to an exile and a two-state solution negotiation. And if we apply enough pressure, at least um, ensuring that that happens rather than just being re uh, refugees um, in uh, Egypt. Uh, and then also getting ahead the Taiwan and uh, China situation. Now, all of those conflicts are hangovers from property rights and negotiations that happened after World War II when the IMF was actually created. Um, and we had the Bretton Woods meeting where the US dollar and the New World Order was negotiated um, that is steadily falling apart. And if this does go into from a regional war to a world war, um, then I think we can look at history to understand what comes next. And so I'd like to give commentary throughout 
um, to try and help you follow the money. It's not an exact science because geopolitics is very hard to predict. One move, one chess move leads to another and no one fully understands the different relationships and negotiations that different countries have. We can only speculate, but following the money has always been my guiding force and has allowed me to get ahead of several things so that I can actually be prepared. I live in the Isle of Man because I was predicting large geopolitical conflict uh, when the US dollar slowly declines over a 10 to 20 year period. And I want to live in the place with the lowest crime. So I looked at the map and said, here's the place with the lowest crime um, that is least likely to be involved in the conflict. And I was prepared for that approximately five years ago. So, um, and that's really what my YouTube channel has always been about. So I would like to um, put share um, some of these insights um, in future videos. So if you'd like to subscribe, then you will get a notification, hit the bell symbol, hit all, or follow me on Twitter. Right. Um, so uh, back to the humanitarian side, um, I would like to really look to uh, other experts that have been involved in this situation um, from the very beginning um, to help people understand why whatever they're sharing and feeding you on the media um, is not exactly what you get if you look at other sources that are on the ground in Gaza and also from those that have been following this uh, before we um, it was entrusted upon the mainstream media after the atrocities that happened in October the 7th um, that was based upon a deep history of atrocities equally as bad um, that we need to understand. And so I'm going to now move over to the main content um, which is uh, experts on is this a genocide? Is this words like concentration camp and ethnic cleansing dramatizations? Um, and where does this lead so that we can understand the flow of funds in terms of Egypt, IMF, uh, the cost to Israel on their economy um, that I'll be covering in future videos? So as always, um, let's head over to the content now. It's how you characterize what's been happening since October 8th, whether to characterize it as a war or to characterize it as, I think, and just I don't want to you know, to toot my horn, but I do teach international law. I teach the laws of war or whether to characterize it as a genocide. So let's see the facts and then, you know, we can, we can dispute them, argue about them. Uh, but compact, so what, compact them, yeah. Okay, so what are the facts? On October 8th, three statements were made by Israeli leading officials. Statement number one was by Defense Minister Galan. Galan said, we're not going to admit any water, fuel, or electricity, or food into Gaza. Statement number two was made by the president of Israel, Mr. Herzog. Mr. Herzog said, we do not acknowledge any distinction between Hamas fighters and the civilian population. And now statement number three is the statement by Mr. Netanyahu. He said, this is going to be a long war. It's going to be our longest war. So now you add those three statements up. No food, no water, no electricity. But, but they get water from the ground wells. No, right? they don't. 97% of the water is poisonous from the ground wells. 97% is poisonous. According to... According to everybody. No, because CNN, I mean, there's CNN so much reason, There's so different. much research done on the water situation okay, okay. in Gaza. I'm, I'm no expert in Gaza, okay. but I saw it in 97% is not fit for human consumption. It's not potable. Okay. Okay? So now, you add those three sentence, uh, statements up, and what do you get? It means the entire human po population of Gaza, mm. of whom more than one million are children, they will not have access to food, they will not have access to water. They will not have access to fuel or electricity, which means all the hospitals will be inoperative. The hospitals cannot operate without the fuel. We are also told that the entire population is a legitimate target for the Israeli army. When you add those statements up together, I can't see how. I can't see how it's possible to conclude that Israel has launched anything except a war of genocide 
against the people of Gaza. What would you do if you were sitting at your home and a foreign military knocked down the door, broke in, threw your furniture across the length of the street, beat up your mother, imprisoned your father, and told you that your house is now theirs? What would you do if you were told that for the rest of your life you were going to have to live in a cage, be seized? What would you do if someone shot and killed your brother for simply being who they are? Me and my brothers are scared for each other, so we always try to be together because if we die together that will be the best thing because we can still see each other when we go to heaven. For decades the Israeli regime has presented itself on the international stage as a victim and to Palestinians the image that was communicated to us is that of a completely different reality. The Israeli regime does not waste an opportunity to intimidate us, to instill fear within us. There is this strong man image not only to intimidate us but to reassure the Israeli society who frankly needs our suffering in order to feel safe, needs images of our misery, of our bloodied and bruised young people to feel safe. Growing up Palestinian in occupied Jerusalem, it feels like you have a police officer in your bed and a police officer on your couch and a police officer in your kitchen. There is so much surveillance of every aspect of your life, be it your social life, your political thought, your activities at school, your activities on the street. They are telling us if we dare even think to resist, we are going to be clamped down on. You grow up in Palestine and you hear about the Nakba, which is the mass displacement of the Palestinian people at the hands of Zionist militias that would later form today's Israeli military. But the Nakba is not in the past tense. It's not a tragedy that once passed that we commemorate today, but it is in fact ongoing. For 75 years, the Israeli government has worked to ensure we no longer existed. The homes they demolish, the villages they depopulate, the children they kill and imprison is the evidence of this. The material evidence is on our bodies. I know this firsthand because when I was 11 years old, a settler organization backed by the Israeli military broke into our house. One of a few organizations that are registered as charities, either in the UK or in the United States, that collaborate with the Israeli government to take over Palestinian houses all over occupied Palestine. In 2009, I was coming home from school to find all of our furniture scattered across the length of the street. I saw that my grandmother had been hospitalized. This is my grandmother. There were dozens and dozens of soldiers. And that the settlers had taken over half of our house. Ten years later, they came back to take over the rest of our house and the rest of our neighborhood. Yaqob, you know this is not your house. Yes, but if I go, you don't go back. So what's the problem? Why are you yelling at me? I didn't do this. You are stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. It's quite an absurd situation to find yourself in, right? American or British nationals who are often fleeing fraud charges or sexual abuse charges who come to occupy Jerusalem to squat in our houses as if they are theirs by divine decree, as if God is some kind of real estate agent. There's only one sovereign body here. There's only one people that have a connection to this land. There is no such thing as a Palestinian people, no such thing as a Palestinian state, and there's no such thing as any sovereignty by anyone except the Jewish people here. Living on the brink of displacement almost distorts your sense of time. Your entire perception of the world and your reality becomes wrapped up in these court hearings and in these settler campaigns and these harassments and these police raids. And it's not just the psychological and emotional damage, it's the financial damages, it's the loss of time. It's living your entire life without having any agency almost. My whole childhood revolved around going to the court hearings and having my father come back from the court hearings and thinking when they would finally come and take over the house and if we were able to buy ourselves some more time, you never knew if that day would be the last night you ever sleep in your bed. I remember we would go to the court hearings and as the lawyers and judges deliberated, we would whisper in each other's ears shards 
of what we thought they said. It's almost like being a zebra at the mercy of a jury of hyenas. My grandmother used to say, if the judge is your enemy, to whom do you complain? The judge himself is a settler, and the court is a settler court, built on top of Palestinian land. And the laws are settler laws that were enacted to facilitate and bureaucratize and legalize the process of your own ethnic cleansing. The fact that there are Palestinians who can smell the humidity of the sea from their kitchen windows, but can never go to the sea because there are dozens of checkpoints that separate them from it, is violence. The the fact that there are Palestinian kids in Lebanon, in refugee camps, who listen to their grandparents detail their past lives in Jaffa, in Yaffa, in Haifa, in Nazareth, who look at those photographs and yearn to visit, but can never visit, is within itself violence. There are 5.3 million Palestinian refugees in refugee camps today who long to return to their homeland, and their exile is within itself violence. What is Gaza? Gaza is 25 miles long less than the length of a marathon, and Gaza is five miles wide. That is the distance from where we are now on West 4th Street, NYU, to Columbia University, 116th Street. So if you imagine a marathon by the distance from here to Columbia University, that's Gaza. Gaza is among the most densely populated places on God's earth, it's more populated than Tokyo. The population of Gaza is 2.3 million people. Of those 2.3 million people, 70% are refugees or descendants of refugees. That is Palestinians who were expelled from Israel in 1948, approximately uh, 290,000 ended up in Gaza, and so they're those refugees, their children, and their grandchildren. Jacob, you know this is not your house. Yes, but if I go, you don't go back. So what's the problem? Why are you yelling at me? I didn't do this. I didn't do this. But well, you're you're not it's you're... easy to yell at me, but I didn't do this. Yeah, you are helping. stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. No, no one, no one uh, uh, is allowed to steal it, Yammi. Gaza, a fact that should be of interest and concern to your listeners, Gaza is over half children. Uh, in the past three weeks, Israel has killed about 3,500 children in Gaza. That's more children have been killed in Gaza than all the war zones in the world combined for the years 2020 2021, and 2022. The last time more children were killed in the a, in a, in a total war zones in the world was in 2019. I see a girl with her teddy bear. This is obviously another child.
Israel did not leave Gaza in 2005. Israel redeployed its troops from inside Gaza to the perimeter of Gaza. Even Israel's leading expert on international law, Yoram Dinstein, the former president of Tel Aviv University, even he acknowledged that after Israel redeployed its troops, Gaza was still under Israeli occupation. There is no human rights organization, even including Yoram Dinstein, who's quite conservative, who denies that if you control everything that goes in, you control everything that goes out, you control the airspace, you control the waters, you're the occupying power. Our ability to remain steadfast on our land is a form of resistance. The fact that we get sent dozens and dozens of settlers who get salaries to sit in our front yard to terrorize us, to make our lives a living hell. The fact that we have to deal with police brutality at all times. The fact that we have to deal with a myriad of laws and laws that are there to displace us, to ethnically cleanse us, to erase us, to silence us, to put us in jail. And yet we are able to continue is amazing. People like the word resilience but I think we're very stubborn. And our ability to be steadfast and to stay where we are and our ability to cope and deal with the horrors that none of these Americans or British nationals that spend their lives defending would tolerate living under for one second. All of these defenders of apartheid, all of these defenders of Israeli settler colonialism, if they had to come and live in our reality for one split second, they would not bear it. British politicians, American politicians, German politicians, they are not mere supporters of Israeli colonialism in Palestine, they are partners. Of course they are not going to talk about Palestinians' right to self-determination, the same way they are not going to talk about Palestinians' right to resist or Palestinians' right to defend themselves. It's the same reason why they see no issue in talking about a nuclear state's right to defend itself from an unarmed population as though that makes any sense. It is absurd that the world today has been duped to believe that one of the most lethal armies in the world, one of the most highly funded armies in the world, a nuclear state, is somehow defending itself against a population of refugees that are kept in an open air prison, that are kept surrounded by a nine meter high concrete wall that swallows their land and tears their families apart. People hear the word colonialism and they think of something that is long gone in the past and they don't realize that it exists in the present tense in my front yard, in my neighborhood, on my street. There are Palestinian villages that today are being uprooted to be replaced by settler towns. There are Palestinian roads and cemeteries that are being desecrated to be replaced by military outposts and police departments. Colonialism is not something that the world has rid itself of. It is alive and well and eating at the land in Palestine. When we think of colonialism, all of us have a moral clarity. We know that it's bad, we outright reject it. And yet when we look at colonialism in Palestine today, this is a complicated issue, this is a nuanced issue, this is a touchy topic, it's a sensitive topic, we're not allowed to talk about it because it might ruin my career prospects. But need I remind you, across history, opposition to atrocities has not been met with applause. People who opposed injustices, who opposed colonialism, who opposed slavery, were not met with congratulations and red carpets and applause and awards. In fact, they were targeted and attacked and censored and smeared and persecuted. It is not easy to be on the right side of history. It takes courage. Ignorance is not the problem. It is inaction. Everything I've said here today has been said by hundreds, if not thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Palestinians before me. And it is about time that something is done about the 75 years of Israeli settler colonialism in our lands. It is about time that we move on from trying to debate something so clearly indefensible and to try to create some justice for the Palestinians that are living today. It has gone on for too long and we deserve this justice within our lifetime. It's easy to look at people like Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Nelson Mandela, and think of them as courageous icons who must be respected. What is difficult is looking at an injustice as it happens in real time and deciding that you want to take a moral stance, that you want to be on the right side of history. Those of you watching this today have a chance to be on the right side of history. But the question is, are you going to take it?
Nothing can go into Gaza and nothing can leave Gaza without Israel's permission. No one can go into Gaza and no one can leave Gaza without Israel's permission. Israel controls the, water, the uh, surrounding water. Israel controls the airspace. Now, here is fun Gaza. 20, um, 50 percent of the population is unemployed. 60 percent of the children, of the young people, 60 percent of the young people are unemployed. Half the population in Gaza is classified by international humanitarian organizations as suffering from, quote, extreme food insecurity. That's Gaza. This is an avalanche of human suffering that's 100% man-made. It is the, the worst humanitarian catastrophe I've experienced in my lifetime and in my growingly long career in humanitarian medicine. And it's burning through the hearts of every single humanitarian that I know. You know, I'm going to paint a picture for you of the degree of suffering that we're seeing. People keep asking me about medical aid and hospitals and the situation of the hospitals. The entire hospital healthcare system collapsed almost a week ago. It was announced on TV for the whole world to see. And in that week, there has been indiscriminate bombardment. And I, I don't even know if indiscriminate is the right term because it's targeting healthcare facilities, ambulances, churches, mosques, schools, refugee camps, densely populated refugee camps, wiping out entire families in a second, entire multi-generational extended families in a second. There are almost 1,000 families in the Gaza Strip who have had at least two members of their family, at least two members killed in the last three weeks. There are almost 4,000 children who have been killed and identified, excluding almost a thousand children whose bodies are still trapped under the rubble. Some of them may be alive for a long period before they ultimately die under the rubble. And I'm sorry if there are any young you know, children watching this, perhaps this is a, a good time to ask them to leave the room, but I think it's important that I paint a picture, particularly when I'm following a news narrative that almost dismisses this avalanche of, of suffering that that is, unprecedented in modern times. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an acronym in the in the Gaza Strip right now. You know, I, I'm a pediatric intensive care doctor. I see a lot of suffering in my career. There's an acronym that is unique to the Gaza Strip and it's called, it's WCNSF, wounded child, no surviving family. Children, and it, it is used not infrequently in the last three weeks. Mm -hmm. It was coined in the last three, three weeks. One physician told me two days ago that, or a few days ago, that a little uh, girl came in wounded and she had a piece of paper in her pocket that she handed to him. He sent me a picture of the piece of paper. It had 27 names on it. And she said, these are the members of my family that were with me in my home. Please look for them. Please look for them under the rubble. Don't look for this one. And she points to the name of her sister. I know she's already dead. This is a 10 year old little girl. Wounded child, no surviving family should not exist as an acronym. And to, to follow President Biden as he continues to justify and to warmonger, mm -hmm. all I can say is this has to stop. It's a collective stain on our humanity. It's a, a, a stain on our mm -hmm. collective humanity. Tony, and let me ask you, I, you paint such a, a vivid and horrific picture. Um, you really do. And I, and I understand that these are your friends and who you've worked with and, and how difficult that must be. You're not alone. I, I, I've been hearing today from reading testimony today from Philip Lazzarini, who's the Commissioner General of UNRWA. He's been speaking to the UN Security Council. He said this, the sanitary conditions are appalling. People live on very little bread and whatever is left of some water. 70 of their staff members have been killed and they are looking after 670,000 people in their refugee centres. Is there any sign from what you're hearing that of a humanitarian pause or pauses that could be negotiated? I'm not a politician, but the word pause to me makes no sense. You know, you pause to, to, to nourish and, and, and hydrate a population before you 
kill them. It, it just doesn't make any sense for me. You, you stop the bombardment. That is what that is what the entire global community should be pushing for and should be uh, insisting on. You, you, you know, and, and I think uh, in, in leading up to my introduction, I think you interviewed somebody who said something very similar, a, a, a Gazan who said something very similar. You know, the priority is not giving us aid. You need to stop the indiscriminate bombardment. So I think, yes, what is needed is a humanitarian truce or a ceasefire, global intervention, things that were voted for by the overwhelming majority of countries on this planet a few days ago in the General Assembly of the United Nations, yet they're not adhered to and are, are completely disregarded by the powers that be. Two powers, to make to be specific. Yeah, the war aim is to remove Gaza, Hamas from Gaza. That is what the war aim is. So I would have put it to you, Norman Finkelstein. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is a legitimate war aim? Well, let's do two things. Number one, let's clarify what we mean by Hamas. You say you want to remove Hamas yes. from Gaza. Now, I can cite a half dozen statements, and in fact, at the end, if you want, I could provide you with a half dozen statements or more by Israeli officials saying, Let's use this opportunity uh -oh. to get rid of the population of Gaza. That's Hamas. Hamas, for your listeners, you should bear in mind. Hamas means, when Israel says get rid of Hamas, it means the 2.3 million people of Gaza. No, it doesn't. It wants to clear up what it calls, clear out the northern sector, which means among the most densely populated places on God's earth, they want to take half the population, namely what's called the northern sector, and push them into the south. So now among the most densely populated places on God's earth is going to be doubly, doubly densely populated. Why do they want to do that? To force Egypt to open the Rafa gate. They've said it over and over again. They want to, to force they them want to, into Sinai. You said they want to, to get to get rid of them, force them into the Sinai. So Hamas means a mass ethnic cleansing. That's what it means when you say Hamas. This is not a conflict. This is not clashes. This is an army working with a militarized population of settlers, subjugating and oppressing Palestinians. I think portraying what's happening as an equal battle between Israelis and Palestinians takes away from the um, actual calculated governmental efforts to ethnically cleanse this neighborhood and to ethnically cleanse this entire country. I think Western media that uses words like clashes and conflict to describe colonialism, to describe military occupation, to describe power dynamics that are so um, drastically desperate is unprofessional and it lacks any journalistic integrity. In the past 10 days we have seen police brutality like we've not seen before in this neighborhood. The street is essentially blockaded, we're not allowed in, even those of us whose IDs say we live here have to kind of sneak into our own homes. Um, we're not allowed to go to the store, we're not allowed to go anywhere. In addition to that, Israeli settlers and the Israeli occupation forces have been invading our homes for the past week, throwing rubber-coated bullets, sound bombs, tear gas inside our homes. Settler organizations the Israeli state took over. The situation that your family is in right now. Do you support the protests, uh, the violent protests that have erupted in solidarity with you and, and, and other families in your position right now? Do you support um, the violent dispossession of me and my family? I felt like that was a crazy question. I felt like that was a manipulative question. And I felt like Palestinians historically and systemically are put in a place that manufactures their consent, that um, makes them out to be the villains when the facts on the ground are the opposite of that. I think it's super sinister on, the, on mass media's part to enable such a dynamic when, the, when it's so desperate from the truth.
Palestinians everywhere are getting brutalized and subjugated by the Israeli occupation authorities. Um, this has happened since 1948, but especially in the past few weeks, since the Sheikh Jarrah community has decided to start protesting the efforts of ethnic cleansing at the hands of Israeli settler organizations and the government. Every year, every year, the UN General Assembly votes on a resolution called Peaceful Settlement of the, of the uh, Palestine Question. And every year, the whole world votes on one side, namely the terms that are spelled out, Israel, the United States, and some Pacific atolls, Tuvalu, Palu, Tonga, together with the U.S., and Israel vote against it. That record cannot be easily effaced because it's been every year since maybe 2000. Others, and I am one of those others, were hoping that the very possibility of a wider regional war would cause Netanyahu to accept the demands of President Biden and Secretary Blinken for at least a temporary ceasefire so that the humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip could be addressed. I'm afraid that the demand of President Biden taken all the way to the Israeli government by Secretary Blinken was contemptuously dismissed by Benjamin Netanyahu, even though the United States is paying for all of this instead of a ceasefire two of the most depraved war crimes so far in this conflict took place. The first was something that will never be forgotten, the massacre of Rashid Street, where Palestinian refugees fleeing from the north of Gaza to the south of Gaza, as Israel called on them to do repeatedly. Well, Rashid Street is the road to the south. An Israeli attack on a convoy of Palestinian refugees was strewn out, dead, mutilated, decapitated. Dozens of bodies lying on the road, the blood stains smearing the entire highway. Cold blooded mass murder of civilian refugees fleeing in the direction that the murderers told them to flee in. And Having told people that the Rafah gate into Egypt was available and open for patients in desperate need, these patients loaded into ambulances. And as they were headed out of the gate of the Al-Shifa hospital, heading for Rafah and safety in Egypt, they were bombed in the most savage attack possible to imagine. Ambulances at the gate of a hospital destroyed into pieces of blood-stained flesh. That was Netanyahu's answer to Blinken's call from President Biden for a ceasefire. Ceasefire, no, we're going to increase the fire. Anyway, Syed Hassan went through the conflict, its origins, and where it might be headed. He was Delphic, of course, because if he declared war there, Israel would have bombed the thousands of people who'd come to hear him speak. It's quite clear, though, that Hezbollah has already entered the war. There's no need for a declaration of that. Both sides, Israel and Hezbollah, have dozens of martyrs already in the military clashes between them. But what Nasrallah said was that if the bombing of civilians continues, then not only Hezbollah, but other actors in the region, Arab and non-Arab, would ineluctably be drawn into the conflict because their public cannot tolerate 
seeing the savagery being meted out to unarmed and defenseless civilians, most of them children and women, they're massacring the innocents. It's the slaughter of the innocents. And Nasrallah said that we cannot stand by. So look out for a significant increase in the number of attacks, but not just on Israeli targets. Nasrallah spent the most important part of his speech of fixing fairly, squarely, the United States right in the center of this picture. He believes, and this he shares with President Putin, who said the same thing earlier in the week. The United States is roaming around the world, creating chaos, mayhem, murder, bloodshed, instability everywhere in the world. And he pointed out to President Biden, all your naval ships sitting offshore in the eastern Mediterranean don't frighten us. They never have frightened us, and they don't frighten us now. And we have plans, he said, to deal with your naval assets sitting on the shores of the Mediterranean. And you'd be a fool, President Biden, if you didn't believe him, because one thing that characterizes Nasrallah, as compared with some, maybe many other leaders in the Arab world. When Nasrallah says something, he does it. On the one hand, as a humanitar sheer humanitarian gesture, should you open up the border, should Egypt open up the border of Gaza and let the people out? On the other hand, not that I would make any apologies for uh, the mass murderer uh, of Egypt, the head of state, Mr. Sisi. But he has a problem. The problem is that our Secretary of State Blinken, Anthony Blinken, and the U.S. administration in general, and Israel, and Israel, have been applying huge pressure on Egypt to let the people go into, into Egypt. And then he says, I'm not going to facilitate, I am not going to abet the ethnic cleansing of Gazans into Egypt. I don't want to be part of that. And then what do you say to that? Well, I looked around for what people were saying. I think the obvious answer is, don't force them to flee. There should be a ceasefire now. So they don't have to flee. Let's end with that's that. Their, that's their home. And I want people to bear in mind 70% are refugees from 48, from 1948 when Israel was created. They have lived since 1948 in refugee camps in Gaza, 70%. And now Israel wants to turn them into refugees twice over to dispatch them into the Sinai desert to rot and die because of one thing you can be certain, Sisi, President Sisi of Egypt, will never let them assimilate into Egyptian society. That's never going to happen. So now you want to take the refugees from 1948 who were living in the refugee camps in Gaza and make them refugees again. That's the U.S. plan. Okay. And now Israel is saying, we're, because Egypt is now facing a huge economic crisis, and Israel is saying, we will get the IMF to release money to you, because right now, one half of their revenues are being used to service the debt. We will give you money, and you let the refugees in there. Now, I ask you, Professor, is that not hostage-taking? Okay. Is that not hostage taking Professor, to want to expel them? No, first of all, a no, second time. Where are you getting Expel this them a second time now into the Sinai Desert. Is that not well, hostage okay. taking? Okay, so I hope um, you enjoyed is just not the right word. I hope you were enlightened or educated into some of those perspectives. Um, and uh, as I said in the beginning. Um, this really allows, lays the foundation for us to try and follow the money 
get ahead of some of these trends, understand the impact on us. If this looks increasingly likely to go from escalate towards a regional war and a world war, um, if it touches upon some of the issues that are important to some of the nuclear powers like Russia, uh, China, and it certainly looks like it's going to impact America and Britain because they put themselves in the center of the conflict with their unconditional support to Israel, even if it goes beyond the red line to um, crimes and atrocities and international war crimes like we are seeing at the moment. Um, they're not firing any financial weapons of mass destruction like they did on Russia, um, you know, from the atrocities of what happened um, with the Russian invasion. Um, but that is because they are ideologically aligned and therefore sanctions and financial weapons of mass destruction, which leads to incredible death and destruction slowly through inflation, destroying currencies, destroying economies. And of course, they come in to save the day um, as their economic hitmen from the IMF, or even China comes along with their Belt and Road Initiative um, to try and save the day. So we're going to discuss a lot more about this as uh, things progress. Um, I want you to be as prepared for, as possible. I've been preparing for a world war for a long time. Um, I hope that it doesn't happen. I really hope that I'm an idiot with a tin foil hat. Um, but I'd rather be on the safe side and I'd rather bring as many people uh, because you are actually my normal content is that you're alive at one of the most interesting times in financial history. Um, many are going to get absolutely destroyed and devastated by it. Others are going to do incredibly well. And I would like to make sure that you're on the right side of that change because the more financially secure you are, the more you can contribute in your unique way where the world is really going to need you if we continue down the path that our leaders and this epic failure in leadership is taking us. My fear is that it's reaching the point of uh, it's too late, um, but we shall see, and I'll keep giving videos. Let's always do this with peace, love, unity, and I cannot believe we now live in a world where a call for ceasefire is seen as an act of terror. But that is where we are, and uh, we have to uh, do what we can in a quest for the truth and to uh, always try and stand by our ethics and our belief around what the right thing is to do. Um, and so I believe that this is the right thing to do for me. Um, you do what is right for you. And hopefully through this friction, we can arrive at the truth and history and God or Allah will be a judge. Um, everyone's actions, their intentions, uh, depending on your belief, uh, maybe you don't believe in those types of things. Maybe you just believe in karma. Um, then uh, always try and act with what is the right thing to do here um, with your version of the truth. And hopefully we can adjust and learn and a massive commitment to knowledge to try and get where we need to be um, as long as we have the right intentions. And that's why we need to engage in two-way um, thoughtful debate uh, you know, um, and uh, we were involved, I was involved for the last two years in a process called Chapter 11, uh, where there was massive fraud upon 650,000 victims. Um, and we had to go through a year and a half process called Chapter 11 to negotiate a solution. It was never the perfect solution for everybody. Uh, but that's where we need to get to with the world watching uh, between the Palestinians and the Israelis to try and get this further forward and get a more optimal outcome than death, destruction, genocide, ethnic cleansing, war crimes, concentration camps, and just the absolute obliteration and death of children that we are seeing right now that breaks all of our hearts when we connect with the human side in all of us. Because one thing is universal. We have universally all agreed that killing children is evil. A massive evil is happening right now. We're justifying it um, with, uh, you know, terminologies like human shields and stuff like that. And maybe these are tragic consequences, um, but we all still need to hold ourselves to the standard, knowing that in the end, we will be judged for what we did here and what we believe to be the truth. I will see you in the next video. Peace.